fate. The fate of you who are listening, of nations, of the world, has often hung upon accident or upon decisions that made another way would have substantially altered the course of human events. Suppose by a stroke of fate, Charles Martel had failed to defeat the Moors at the Battle of Tours in 732 A.D. Would Europe today be Mohammedan? Suppose fate had decreed that there should be no atomic bomb today. Yes, much depends upon a stroke of fate. And tonight we rewrite history as we present a dramatic conception of what might have happened if, by a stroke of fate, America's first secret weapon had succeeded in its intended purpose during the Revolutionary War. In the year 1775, Great Britain held a large portion of the civilized and barbarian world in dominion by virtue of sea power. Her world supremacy was maintained by thousands of ships. But Britain's sea power was actually threatened with a complete and utter disaster at the beginning of the Revolution and by an incredibly modern weapon. Our story of that weapon is historically true up to our stroke of fate. And from then on, we speculate. Our narrator is Benjamin Franklin, printer, late of Philadelphia. During the late summer of the year 1775 at Saybrook in Connecticut, an old man and a much younger one... Dr. Benjamin Gale and David Bushnell, Yale College, class of 1775, were discussing a matter of grave import. Dr. Gale, don't you see? Yes, Davy, I see. I see all too well. It could end the war quickly. It could save thousands of lives. I believe it could. Have you brought the new drawings? Yes, I finished the new design this afternoon. Here it is. Hmm. Why have you added a new churning affair at the top? To speed up the rising action, Doctor. To give more safety for the man inside. But each time you pierce the skin of the device with another shaft, the possibility of disaster is augmented. I've thought of that, of course. I've spent many a night without sleep thinking it out, and I found a solution. A sort of tarry, oily caulking mixture, sir, packed about each entering rod. I hope it works, lad. It will work. It must. Yes, it must. But there's another problem. Air and light, they go together. The man inside must be able to see. He will need to read a compass and all those gauges. He has... How long, do you think? I hope, sir, he has air enough for 30 minutes. So, he has 30 minutes to live at best. But anything that lets him see, anything that burns to give him light, well, it must eat up precious air by by combustion. Have you solved the problem of light? No, doctor, I have not. Davy? Yes, Dr. Gale? You realize that a man must risk his life in this this terrible device of yours? Yes, I do. I think we must solve the problem of light. And there is only one man in North America who might be able to offer a solution. Fortunately, he's a friend of mine. I shall go to Philadelphia and call upon Dr. Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> Word of my experiment with the kite, you see, had spread far and wide. Though I must say that in spite of all the fuss that's made over it, I'd accomplished much more valuable results in other directions. However, I was shortly to receive a visitor at my daughter's home in Market Street, and most astonishing news. Well, this is an affair of importance, Dr. Franklin, of terrible importance. Importance, if what you say is fact, my friend, and I'm convinced that you, at least, are convinced... Why, then we have a means of certain victory within our grasp. Sea power sustains the enemy. Just so, Dr. Franklin. We can remove at one stroke the Redcoat's great advantage. But if I am to solve the problem of light within the device, I must see the thing itself. When can we leave for Connecticut, Dr. Gale? I did not much care to travel by land in those days, for I was 70 years of age, afflicted with gout and a hint of the stone, but I could not resist this secret mission. Late at night, making certain we were not followed, we paid a visit to a wooden shed upon an island near Saybrook in the Connecticut River. 
Dr. Gale unlocked the rickety door, and young David Bushnell held his lantern high as he ushered us in. After you, gentlemen. There it is, Dr. Franklin. The American turtle. Uh, you call it the turtle, gentlemen? <laughs> yes, sir. It looks like a turtle somewhat. Well, <laughs> tis backed like a turtle, Mr. Bushnell. <laughs> it's like a fat turtle set on end with a rudder for a tail. It's small, too. I doubt that I would fit inside. Well, it will need a small man, Doctor. And a strong one. Yes, I can see that. A small man and a brave one. Do you suppose I could take a look inside this... Uh, this, uh, well, this uh, submarine vessel? I looked. I could see no reason why the contrivance should not work in practice. It's submerged by admitting water from the sea into a diving chamber, and it rose again by expelling the water with pumps operated by handles from within. It was moved by screw propellers revolving in the outside to be manipulated by the poor devil crowded inside with the cranks. And on the top there was a boring device designed to pierce into the hull of a vessel below the waterline and leave attached to the ship under attack an explosive charge, a time bomb. I spent two hours examining the murderous invention. Well, Dr. Franklin... Will it work? Yes, I... I think it will. Good. But the problem of light, so that the man inside this turtle can see how deeply he's submerged. I believe that is easily solved. You need a light inside that glows but does not burn. A light that consumes the air slowly, very slowly indeed. Now, there are such luminous materials in nature, decaying vegetable matter... Foxfire is one such substance. Of course, I should have thought. We could use foxfire in the depth gauges. To be sure. However, there's another problem. Most British warships are copper sheathed below the waterline. The drill you expect to use to attach the explosive uh, up on top there. Now, that's for boring into wood, I believe. But we have drills for metal, sir. It would be easy to substitute. I wouldn't be sure. This strange craft, submerged, will have little weight as it's buoyed up by water. To drill through metal, no, I think not. If you try to pierce metal, the turtle would just slither away from under a ship. But my craft can move with no more than 18 inches of the top above the surface. It can submerge. It can be moved about underwater. We've tried all that. Now, surely, we can find a way... Yes, yes, I think we can. This copper sheathing on the British ships is not a solid affair. It's put on in sheets like shingles on a roof. If the man inside were expert indeed, he could force the drill in between the copper shingles into the wood. Mm. We shall need a skillful man inside as well as a brave one. And strong, too. I've been speculating for two hours on the man inside. Who? Who could attempt such a thing? It's death itself, given the slightest mischance. Now, who would try such an adventure? I would. You? I shall insist upon it. How could I ask anyone else to take my place? I had been a powerful swimmer in my own youth and never wanted to take chances with wind and tide, but I looked at Davy Bushnell, slight of build. Oh, it would never do, never in the world. And what if by some failure of the human creature inside the coffin craft it should be captured? It could be turned against us, like all such dramatic new weapons. Davy Bushnell's pipe stem arms could never crank the propeller of that great bundle of mischief against any sort of tide current. And so we argued most of that night. But how can I? How can I? They will say that I'm a coward. Oh, nonsense, lad. People have known you here in Saybrook since you were a child. Oh, son, son, I must ask you once more. Do you care what fools say? Or do you cherish our cause? You've given us the weapon of victory. Isn't that enough? Very well, then. Dr. Frank and I shall do as you both wish. I shall ask General Sam Parsons for volunteers. The volunteers.
volunteers came from General, General Samuel H. Parsons Continental Command in New England. They were pledged to secrecy. They were shown the turtle. One by one, they declined with all respect the submersible death chamber until... Name? Ezra Lee, Sergeant, 4th Regiment. You've seen the vessel. Well, if you'd call it that, yes. Crikey, chum, what a bucket. <laughs> Sergeant, haven't I seen you before? Well, that's possible, Master Bushnell. I was born just across the river at Lyme, been around those parts mostly up till the war. In the shipyards. Well, have you reached a decision, Sergeant? I have. Master Bushnell, I think I can take that cockeyed contraption of yours anywhere you want it to go. Just tell me where. On a moonless night in August of 1776, the turtle having been borne overland to the upper harbor of New York from New Rochelle, Sergeant Lee squeezed himself into the tiny space between the cranks, the pedals, and the gauges. All right. I'm in. Put the lid on. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Is everyone sure the flagship's still there? Oh, she was this afternoon. Huh. HMS Eagle, ship of the line, 64 guns. Mm -hmm. Last we heard, Admiral Sir Richard Howe himself had just come aboard from Staten Island. The time bomb is set. Nobody was sort of careless about that. I said it myself. Mm -hmm. Now, once you drill into the hull between the plates and fasten the bomb, you have 20 minutes to get clear before it explodes. Good. We'll singe black dick's bridges for him good and proper. Well, put the lid on, chum. Here we go. are listening to what might have happened if, by a stroke of fate, America's first secret weapon, David Bushnell's submarine, had succeeded in its intended purpose. Our story has been historically true up until the stroke of fate, which has already occurred just a few moments ago. What it was, we shall eventually reveal. But David Bushnell's submarine did historically exist, and Ezra Lee actually did sally forth in it against Lord Howe's flagship. From now on, we speculate in part with Dr. Benjamin Franklin as our guide. On the ebb tide, Sergeant Ezra Lee half drifts, half cranks his way down upon the British fleet in New York Harbor. Down upon the great flagship where sleeps a gentleman who once in London was my own good friend... Lord Richard Howe, commander of all the British forces in North America. But the tide outgoing bears the thin vessel down beyond the fleet. For two and one half hours, the sergeant struggles, foot by precious foot, turning those awful cranks against the harbor tide, back and into position close to His Majesty's ship, the Eagle. Dawn is almost upon him. He must move rapidly now. He presses a foot valve, submerges... The fools. We should have started an hour sooner. Not too far down. Not too far. By the numbers. Close intake valve. Close valve. <coughs> valve closed. Now, must get drilled between copper plates... Think. Think what they said. If it turns easy, it's against metal. If it turns hard, I've hit wood. Careful now. It turns hard. Oh, remember now. Remember. By the numbers. Release drill. Pull pin. Release bomb. So and done. Now, crank to get away. Now, pump her out. Pump, you idiot. Pump. Up we go. Up. Up. Now to open the... 
catch it. Get some air. Turn the cranks now. Turn. Turn. Must get away from the ship. Crank. Crank. Turn. Crank. Turn them over. How long? How long? How long will it go? Sergeant Ezra Lee got clean away, but not my one-time friend, Lord Richard Howe, Admiral of the Fleet. He was blown to small bits, along with HMS Eagle, 64 guns. After this deed, terror reigned in the British Navy, and at George Washington's headquarters on Manhattan some ten days later... You have, then, gentlemen, my most heartfelt congratulations upon your exploit. Oh, we thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. There will be other, more substantial rewards for you, and soon. General, sir. Yes, Sergeant? Uh, Davy here. He would have gone down in the turtle himself, Ezra, sir. I asked you not to... I know you did. General, he wanted to go. I had to fight him off at the end. Really. There's glory enough for both of you in this deed. And there's plenty more limey ships down in the harbor waiting for Davy's pot to blow him up. No. Huh? No, not now. Not in a hurry. I have received just this morning a long letter from Dr. Franklin concerning the most judicious use of this new device. His counsel is sensible, as always. Well, what does he do? advise, sir? That we make a maximum and secret use of this new force. That we wait until we have been able to build at least 30 of these submarine vessels before we attack again. And that then we launch them upon the enemy from every harbor we can reach. Two each day for 15 days. 30 of them? Hmm. They will take months to build, General. Many months. We shall have the time. I'll see to that. And you shall have the money, Master Bushnell. We will acquire as rapidly as we can a store of these... these Lobster pots, General? <laughs> these deadly <laughs> barrels, yes. We will put together what I believe merchants call a stockpile of your underwater weapons. Well, that's fine, sir. And here is your part, Sergeant Lee. Oh, yes, sir. As Captain Lee... Cap wow. Captain? You oh. will be in command of a training depot for underwater pilots. <laughs> You will teach 40 picked men your skills, Captain. Well, I, I'll try, sir, but I'm better at doing than teaching. Uh, you must learn to teach. <laughs> Master Bushnell, you will be placed in charge of assembling these craft at whatever point we shall eventually choose. Yes, sir. When we have 30 vessels and at least 30 trained pilots, we'll move the craft on covered hay wagons to all the harbors we can reach. General Washington, sir. Yes? There's a further possibility, I believe. Now, these... These pots of ours can be carried on the decks of schooners, or even smaller craft. Could we not spare perhaps two of them to strike the enemy in his own home ports, or even in the Indies? But the risk of capture at sea would be too great. But, sir, suppose the small submarine on the deck of a disguised carrier vessel were mined at all times with an explosive charge, so that at the slightest approach of danger or an enemy chase, it could be lifted oversides and blown to bits. I see, I see. Well, we'll think about that, Master Bushnell. In the meantime, secrecy is our watchword. It took quite a while, longer than anyone had thought in the beginning. There was a great pother of foundry agreements and the usual hanky-panky and red tape... But in the late summer of 1777, while General Washington was undergoing defeat at Brandywine, 30 submarine vessels had been secretly completed. By that time, I was in residence at Passy near Paris, endeavoring to spur into action against the British a dull-witted French king. And there the reports came in, one by one, and they made a most satisfactory sound. In New York Harbor, five ships of the line were destroyed in one night of flaming wrath. Four lobster pots came back. No one knows what happened to the fifth. At Halifax in Nova Scotia, three days later, HMS Furious, 48 guns, 
and the frigate Persephone went up in flames and down in tarry bubbles. Two lobster pots had been hauled and mauled overland by main men across a wilderness to reach within striking distance. The pilots scuttled their barrels in deep water and swam ashore after the attack. In the Delaware, under the patrician nose of General Sir William Howe, Lord Richard's brother, four attempts were made. Three succeeded. The fourth submarine pilot, rather than risk capture, blew himself and his barrel to kingdom come. His name was Ezra Lee of Lyme, Connecticut. But why go on? In the heart of British sea power, in the chambers of Lord North, First Minister to King George III at Westminster, London, the Prime Minister had a visitor, his political opponent, the Whig party leader, Lord Rockingham. How many then? How many? How many ships? I have told you, Rockingham, His Majesty's government has nothing to conceal. So far, 23 ships have been destroyed. I am as completely mystified by this affair as you are, or Burke, or Fox, or any Whiggish laborer on the Liverpool docks. But there are rumors, sir, everywhere. You will be faced with questions in Parliament on the morrow, I assure you. Yes, I know. And there are no answers. The rumors are true. You have my sympathy, Lord North. We'll not press you too closely in debate. Oh, you'll not need to exert yourself. There is another item as yet undisclosed to gossip. A month ago at Bombay, within the harbor, a merchantman of the East India Company was destroyed in this same fashion. And with all her cargo, a most valuable cargo. My deepest condolences, sir. Yes. You will have the public on your side once the news is out in Threadneedle Street. On our side, we'll have Burke, Pitt, Shelburne, Camden, Grafton, Fox, Conway, Richmond, Cavendish. All good friends of America. I have always counted myself among America's friends, my lord. But the Americans could never see the matter in that light. Come in. Dispatch from Paris, sir. Delivered in great haste. The messenger says it's most urgent. Let me have it, if you please. Well, Rockingham, you may as well know this, too. This is a letter from our ambassador to Louis XVI. He has received a communication from Benjamin Franklin, the American agent in Paris. Franklin's message is brief. He says, Unless steps toward a peace settlement upon a basis of independence for the American colonies are set in motion at once, the secret of the destructive explosions lately encountered by His Britannic Majesty's Navy will be revealed to A suitable French Navy authority. Sir, uh, Lord North. Can I help you? No, no. No, I'm, I'm all right. I, I can understand you, your momentary weakness, sir. If the French should be given the secret... Yes. This island would no longer rule the ocean world. Have you decided upon a course of action, Lord North? Rockingham... You and your friends have won. I shall resign. I shall call upon the king tonight. And I shall suggest to his majesty that we make peace with the Americans on their own terms at once. It will be your task, sir, to negotiate the treaty. I do not envy you. On the third day of December in 1777, under London instruction, General Sir William Howe, brother of the Admiral, rode out from Philadelphia in a snowstorm. He came to a harsh place in the hills called Valley Forge. There, beneath a snow-laden marquee, before the headquarters tent of General George Washington, on Mount Joy at Valley Forge, Howe surrendered. Under honorable terms, he delivered up all the military force of His Majesty George III upon the North American continent. 
the war was over. Ladies and gentlemen, please recall these lines in which the stroke of fate occurred that might have indeed changed history. However, there's another problem. Most British warships are copper sheathed below the waterline. The drill you expect to use to attach the explosive uh, up on top there, that's for boring into wood, I believe. And here to explain the significance of our stroke of fate and to speculate further is our consultant on tonight's program, the noted historian James Thomas Flexner, author of the best-selling biography of the Revolutionary War, The Traitor and the Spy, Mr. Flexner. Our stroke of fate was that Franklin pointed out to Bushnell that major British ships had copper-sheathed hulls. Actually, he did not do this. Bushnell's submarine, the first that ever moved underwater, although an amazing invention, came to nothing because everyone ignored this tiny detail. Lee did get under the British flagship, but supplied only with the wood drill. He could not fasten the bomb. Lack of air forced him at last to rise. British sailors, noticing something peculiar moving through the water, set after him in a rowboat. In desperation, Lee released the bomb. Fearing a Yankee trick, the British backwatered. Lee got away but the bomb did no damage. In the Hudson River, Lee made another attempt, but after he had submerged, the current washed him away from the keel of the warship he was attacking. And then the submarine, as it was being ferried on a surface vessel, was sunk by the enemy. Having no success to point to, Bushnell could secure no backing for another boat. Submarineless, he floated mines down the Delaware into Philadelphia Harbor, but no ships were sunk, and Bushnell soon abandoned his experiments. A tremendous opportunity had been lost. Had copper sheathing been taken into consideration so that the submarine could have been effective, and had the secret been kept so that the British could not develop a defense, the revolution would have ended as abruptly as described in this play. Without ships, England would have sunk instantly into a second-rate power. Almost any concession could have been wrung from the king's ministers had Britannia's rule of the waves been threatened by successful submarine warfare. Thank you, Mr. Flexner. We invite you to listen to the final program of our series next week to hear The Stroke of Fate That Might Have Prevented the Norman Conquest of England in 1066 A.D. Featured in tonight's Stroke of Fate presentation for Edgar Staley as Benjamin Franklin, Hal Stuta as David Bushnell, Ed Begley as Benjamin Gale. Others in the cast were John Stanley, Bernard Lenro, John Thomas, and Ted Osborne. Your announcer, Lionel Rico. Stroke of Fate is produced by Mort and Lester Lewis. Conceived by Mort Lewis, directed by Fred Way. Tonight's play was written by George H. Faulkner. It was prepared in consultation with the Society of American Historians. This is the NBC Radio Network.